Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the MongoDB Podcast Live. Today, we're going to be talking about application-driven analytics or in-app analytics, access to real-time data, and how it can change and improve your software development lifecycle. I've got a special guest today, Jay Runkle. He'll be joining me shortly. As you're jumping into the live stream, welcome. I'd love to know where you're from. And we'll be asking some questions before we get the show kicked off. I'm curious about your knowledge of application-driven analytics and how you may be using it today. Would love to hear your story about real-time or access to real-time data as a part of your applications and how you might be using it today. If you're new to it, if you're new to application-driven analytics, let us know. Get your questions ready. We've got an expert waiting in the wings. He's going to join us very shortly. All right, waiting for folks to join. Welcome to the show. Hari, welcome. Welcome from India. I'm on the east coast of the United States in a little town called Ocean City, right near the beach. And i um, really happy to have you joining us today. We're going to be talking about application-driven analytics, in-app analytics, access to real-time data. We're going to do a demo. It's going to be hands-on today. Uh, my guest is, is an expert in this subject, and he's going to be walking us through how you might be able to leverage data as a part of your, your application, how you can incorporate data into your application. Oh, here comes the flood of people from Zambia. Welcome. London. Kerala. All right. Let us know where you're coming from. Detroit. Harshit, welcome. All right. <clears throat> it's so great to have you with us today. As I mentioned, the topic of the day is application-driven analytics and how important incorporating app, uh, analytics into your application can be, how you can improve your application with that. So we've got an expert that's going to be joining us. His name is Jay Runkel. Jay Runkle is a distinguished solution architect at MongoDB, and he's got a lot of experience helping customers with data. Uh, he and I used to work together in the same team before I moved into developer relations. I'm really excited to have Jay back on the show. As you're coming in, think about your, your questions that you've got for an expert in this space. If you're curious about how you might be able to leverage uh, analytics as a part of your application, get those questions ready. Let us know what you're doing today as it relates to in-app or application-driven analytics. Are you are you using them today? Tell tell me about your your uh, your application. If you've got a, a software project where you're leveraging real-time data, let us know in the in the comments. I'm curious about how people are using analytics as a part of their software applications today. All right, enough from me. I'm going to bring my guest in. As I mentioned, his name is Jay Runkel, and he is a distinguished solutions architect at MongoDB. Let's bring Jay into the stream. Welcome. Hey, Mike. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you back on the show. And uh, you're joining us from New Jersey as well, right? Actually, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Close, though. Okay, outstanding. Fantastic. So we're not far from each other. We've got folks coming in from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, all over the world. Mexico. Welcome, Victor, from Mexico. Fantastic. All right. So, Jay... Uh, tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I am a distinguished solution architect at MongoDB. I've been with MongoDB about nine and a half years. And before that, I worked with another document database company. So I have about 15 years experience with um, document databases. In my role at MongoDB, I do a variety of things. But one of the most cool things I do is work with some of MongoDB's most strategic customers and help them figure out is MongoDB a good fit? And if it is, how they can architect their solution so that they can build the app they want to build, but also build it with the least amount of time and the least amount of you know, cost in terms of in infrastructure. Fantastic. That's great. Uh, shout out to my buddy, Phil, joining us from Philadelphia, another Philadelphian. Uh, and we're, we're getting questions about um, access to the video. It is live. We're live on LinkedIn Live, and we're live on YouTube. You can find us, if you'd rather watch on YouTube, you can find us at youtube.com slash MongoDB. We'll be in the, in the hero section of the MongoDB YouTube page. 
Yeah, Great. the video will be really helpful here because I'm going to actually walk through over the next three weeks how to build an app-driven analytics application using all of the different components of MongoDB's Atlas developer data platform. So being able to see will be really important, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's break down the live stream. We're going to do this in three parts. And um, let's, let's go over some of the things we're going to cover today and what folks might want to do to get prepared to follow along. Okay. Actually, if you want to, if you want to like share the slides, I think I have a couple slides that kind of yeah, yeah, there you go. It. Perfect. So, if I go the, the the three week kind of plan is to do on the first week, which is today, is to talk about what app driven analytics is, and then talk about a particular use case that we're going to use for the context of the app we're going to build, which is around managing rocket launches, which I think is pretty cool. And then, um, and just just uh, as a background, this kind of use, this app that we're building is actually one that I got by working with a MongoDB customer. So this is, you know, with a little bit of Real world. massaging because we only have three hours and we can't use a massive cluster. It is representative of what you might do if you're managing rocket launches. So we'll talk, we'll, we'll then, for the rest of today, build some of the components of, you know, some of the, look at the data, look at some aggregation queries, which you might use to, be the basis of your analytics or also some visualizations, some charts. And that'll be today. And then next week we'll look at some of the more advanced tools in terms of um, building applications like this. So we'll look at Atlas Search. We'll look at how you can take some of the visualizations we build today and embed them into your code. So we'll actually build a real simple React app where we embed some charts. And then we'll also look at triggers, which is kind of, as I get into the story today, you'll see how triggers become relevant to this. And then, so the, the first two weeks are really about how do you embed kind of analytics in your applications that kind of give real time feedback to a user. And then the last week, we'll talk about some of the tools in the Atlas platform that enable you to do more business visualizations. What we mean by that is pulling data from multiple sources, whether that's multiple MongoDB clusters or from other sources like S3, and then doing analytics across wider ranges of data that may, and that maybe run for longer, but give you deeper insights. Gotcha. Okay, great. And this is going to be hands-on today. So Correct. if you're interested in following along, is there somewhere we can send folks for the, the requirements pre -reg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I should mention there's that pre work <clears throat> row up there. So I did, um, I did create a short video that tells you how to set up your development environment, which really means how to create a free account in Atlas and how to download MongoDB Compass and then just how to kind of set up the connection between the two. So everything is um, in GitHub. So if you... You know, so I'll just leave this up for a little bit while I'm talking. So if you want to go to that, you know, GitHub repository and clone it, what I have in there is written instructions, their videos, um, any of these slides that I'm showing are in that GitHub repository. Any code I show today over the next couple of weeks or any configuration that is like JSON is all in there, as well as the data we're going to use. So even if you haven't done the pre-work, you know, you can certainly um, just watch today and then uh, in, in your own time, grab this recording on YouTube or something and try it and follow along. Okay, great. So we'll we'll leave that uh, that banner up for a little bit. If you want to jump over to GitHub and download or, or clone that repository, uh, that'll be available. And of course, keep the feedback coming if you have questions as you're going through. We'll try to answer them live. We're going to be limited in the ability to type responses, especially on, li on, on LinkedIn Live. Uh, unfortunately, I can't type a response that'll go to the comment section, but I'll try and answer uh, questions that come in live. Uh, great. So with that, Jay, you want to jump in? Sure. So like I said, today, what we're going to focus on is I'll give an overview of the Atlas developer data platform. So you get an idea of what we're going to be working with. I'll give a little bit more detail about the rocket use case we're going to build an app for. And then the rest of the today, we'll spend, we'll load some data, we'll inspect it, We'll run some queries in Compass, and then we'll build a couple analytical queries so you can see how that's done in these tools. And then finally, at the end, we'll build a chart in MongoDB's chart. So we'll take, instead of, you know, when, when I'm talking the aggregation framework, that's using MongoDB's query language to actually build queries. And with charts, we're going to be building visualizations that under the covers will generate these 
aggregation queries and you know, display the results pictorially. So just to give you a quick overview of MongoDB's developer platform, you know, this is kind of a market texture diagram, but the main points is that the core of the solution is the MongoDB database based upon its document model. And you know, the flexibility of the document model makes it really easy to build applications. And it also makes it possible to represent a wide variety of different types of relationships so whether you need to represent graph or key value or geospatial or time series or what have you, you can do that all in MongoDB and work with all these different types of data using a single unified query language. And then MongoDB, what we're going to be talking about today is MongoDB Atlas, which is a fully managed platform for running MongoDB. You just, and you'll see if you've done the pre-work, you just go into Atlas and a few mouse clicks and you have a MongoDB cluster running, we deploy it for you, we manage it, we back it up. You know, it's just, you know, you just build your app. It's, that's kind of really the, the powerful thing about it. And then what we've done over the last, let's say five years is surrounded the core MongoDB database in Atlas with a whole host of additional capabilities, things like acid transactions or full text search or the, you know, advanced analytical tools, like you'll see when we take a look at charts. So there's a whole host of capabilities that make it easy to go and build the whole breadth of your application just by staying within Atlas. And because everything's tightly integrated, because everything uses the same common query language, it's really easy and makes it really productive to build applications. Great. So, what this slide uh, basically, uh, the main point of this slide is really to just say, hey, no matter how you're building your application, whether you're gonna have some application that you're writing in Node or Java or C Sharp or whatever it is, you can interact with Atlas via that level. Or if you are more of a data scientist and you need to do analytics, you can you know, work with tools like Spark and things like that to you know, work with um, Atlas. And you have, in terms of, you look at these three columns here, you have three main pillars of functionality. You have the core operational database functionality that MongoDB provides in terms of a document database, indexes, you know, Atlas search, those types of things. You also have a set of capabilities for doing in-app analytics, capabilities like the aggregation framework and row and columnar indexes and time series collections. And then you've got a whole host of tools that enable you to do longer running batch analytical processes, which will look at the third week in terms of MongoDB's data lake and data federation and Atlas SQL products that make it uh, possible to do those types of uh, analytics. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on slides. I just got a couple slides here to talk about the use case, and then we're going to jump right in. So um, the actual use case, like I said, this is modeled after a project I worked on with a MongoDB customer. And what we're looking at is a, you know, you can think about this in company's job is to manage rocket launches. So, you know, you want to put a satellite in space that, you know, you, you hire them, they, they put your satellite into space. And um, one of the systems that they have collects data during the launch. And this data is used to make sure that as the launch is happening, you know, the launch is going according to plan, or if not, how, you know, they can use that information to respond accordingly. And then it's also used post-launch to, you know, to understand more deeply how the rocket behaved and maybe tweak things for the next launch. So a typical rocket launch takes about eight hours, you know, from the time you start the countdown to the time like the payload is in orbit and whatever components of the rocket have you know, either crashed into earth or landed you know, nicely. That's about an eight hour process. So we're collecting around a million metrics per second for eight hours. And like I said, you wanna basically understand what's happening during the launch, get some real time uh, under, uh, understanding. So that's where we kind of the core app driven analytics features are in terms of show me what's happening right now. And then we also will talk about, all right, post-launch, how do we analyze this data using the um, additional capabilities of the Atlas developer data platform? So I don't want to slow you down, but you know, folks might be thinking, like, I'm not launching rockets. There's very few companies out there yeah. that are launching rockets. But explain the, the importance of, 
of access to real time data, maybe in another context, you work with a yeah, number. Yeah, you know, of, it, I, yeah. I picked this. You know, this is one of those things where you're doing a live stream, you want people to show up, so you want to pick something that's really interesting. But um, you know, this is something that is used in just about every application out there. Like, you think if you have a MongoDB service that is managing the shopping cart on your e-commerce site, you want it, it's way more powerful to understand what products people are purchasing right now than to you know run a report every night or every week that shows you what happened yesterday. Another example is in the financial industry, right? If, if you, know, you, you have a trading system, it's really not that helpful to understand what happened all the trades yesterday. What you really want to understand is what trades are occurring right now so that you can respond accordingly. That helpful? Yeah, definitely helpful. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So this is what we're going to build. This or at least this is the problem we're going to solve. And then the actual solution architecture in Atlas. So this is how we're going to build it. So what I have is I have some open source data from Blue Origin. So that if you've um, looked in the GitHub repository in the data folder, which I'll show in a second, you'll see there's some data there. And that's just some data from a Blue Origin launch. And then you can imagine in this use case that there are people, you know, they're managing the launch and they're going to be generating data themselves. And in this case, they're going to be generating notes and comments that we're going to need to manage. So the way this is going to work is that as the rocket, so we're not going to actually have, you know, a live stream of data. It's just not kind of possible to, if you set all that up, it's just kind of too much work. But we're going to load some data into our Atlas cluster that's going to represent that uh, um, you know, the stream of that data. And we're going to load that into Atlas cluster. And then we're going to use some of the capabilities of Atlas to, to manage and interact with that data. Similarly, we're going to also load the notes information into another uh, component of our Atlas cluster. So if you think about our Atlas cluster, we're going to have a database. It's called launch data. We're going to have one collection. So a collection in MongoDB is kind of like a table in a relational database. We're going to have one collection for the data from the rocket. And we're going to have another collection, which is going to be the notes that are generated by the, you know, the individuals during the launch. And those pieces of information are going to be correlated because, as you can imagine, during the launch, somebody types a note. They want to essentially know when that note was um, taken and kind of what they were looking at so that when they go back post-launch, they can kind of drill right into that point of the data and very easily you know, um, figure out what was happening. And we're going to interact with this data and kind of do app-driven analytics using a number of different MongoDB components. One is Chart uh, Compass, which is a, a tool that I, um, you know, that the pre-work asks you to download and install. It's open source, so there's no charge for that. And we'll also be using Atlas Charts, which is the BI visualization tool that's a part of um, Atlas. And we'll also be using the MongoDB aggregation framework, which is just a component of the MongoDB query language that enables you to do complex analytical queries. And that we'll, we'll focus on that part today. And then over the you know, coming weeks, uh, we will also pull in other sources of data, like I have some weather data in an S3 bucket, and we'll use MongoDB Atlas Data Federation to do queries that join both the launch data with the weather data so we can understand how the weather impacted the performance of the rocket. And then we'll also do that, you know, most of the live stream will be using the MongoDB query, query language, but we'll also, uh, on the third week, I'll show you how you can also interact with this data using, using a product we call Atlas SQL. So we're gonna basically, we're gonna build this over the net course of the, um, the next three weeks. Now, the only difference will be is that we're going to use all of the kind of free tier capabilities offered by MongoDB. So in a real production system, you know, a million metrics per second, we would probably have a large sharded cluster and we're only gonna be using a very small M0 cluster. So we're gonna work with a much smaller amount of data, but everything we do would translate to a real production deployment. Great, that's important to know. And folks can follow along completely for free using Atlas. M0 is the tier size, it's a shared instance and it's free forever. Yep, and if you look in the GitHub repository, either there's a video there that walks you through setting all that up, or there are written instructions in the main readme on the GitHub 
project as well. Great. So let's kind of let's jump in to um, and get started. So if you did the pre-work, you should have a, you know, this is my Atlas page, or this is um, at least a one that I created with a uh, another email account so that I wanted to make sure that my, because the MongoDB account that we have is slightly different. So I just want to make sure what I'm showing today mirrors exactly what the audience would see. So this is a, a um, my MongoDB Atlas account for my personal email. And you see, I've created a M0 cluster, right? So it says M0 sandbox, and this is free. If you go, if you follow the instructions, you can create one. You don't have to provide a credit card, any of those types of things. And this is the, um, we're gonna use this cluster during the uh, live stream. And also what the, the, what I, the, the pre-work does is it walks you through how to install MongoDB Compass. So this is MongoDB Compass and it all, it, walks you through how to configure the connection between Compass and um, your Atlas cluster. So I'm gonna assume you have all that done. If you haven't, just go look at the GitHub repository and you know, do it after the live stream. So one of the powerful things uh, about Atlas is that you can deploy a cluster that meets the needs of your application. So we're using an M0 cluster, but before I go in and, and kind of load some data, I wanna just quickly show you that if we were doing this for real, like we were gonna really manage, you know, a million metrics per second for eight hours, which is gonna be 10, 20, 30 terabytes worth of data, we obviously couldn't use a M0 cluster. So we would probably do a number of things. The first thing is we would go down and we would deploy a much larger cluster, you know, bigger servers and shards and things like that. The other thing we would likely do is we would go here and click on this option to say, multi-cloud, multi-region, and the thing I care about here is workload isolation, is because we're doing app-driven analytics today, which means that we're gonna be loading lots of data, a million metrics per second, and we don't ever wanna get in a situation where we write a complex aggregation query or a chart dashboard, and it sends a lot of work to our cluster, and then all of a sudden we stop, we, we get to a point where we can't load those million metrics per second and maybe we drop some data on the ground or things get, or Kafka queue gets backed up or whatever it is. So what we wanna do in a kind of an app driven analytics um, situation like this is to deploy special nodes on which we're gonna run our analytics. So again, like if this was a production application, I would go down here and um, essentially say, I'm gonna do app driven analytics and select a particular type of analytics node. So in this case, I'll say, we're gonna put you know, two nodes in analytics for um, in Northern Virginia, AWS. And then I can go and configure those nodes separately. It might be the case that I need to use M80s to support the stream of uh, data coming from my rocket. But for analytics, I wanna use M200s because they have a lot more RAM because I know that you know, I'm gonna be doing these complex queries and I'm gonna to wanna to have a large amount of cash so that I can execute those queries performantly. Right, so, so super important there, like this is cost optimization and, and isolation of, of workloads to the appropriately sized clusters, right? Yes, so it's, the idea is, you know, cause really the, what we're trying to avoid, you know, like the problem, like the architecture that many organizations deploy cause they have to, is you've got your operational database, it's handling those million metrics per second. And then you ETL the data somewhere else where you run the analytics with queries. And mm -hmm. the reason why you do that, it, well, is one of the reasons why you do that is because you don't want any of those analytical queries to impact with the performance of the rocket launch, because that would be, you know, that's, could be, there could be a person on that launch and it's kind of, you know, life threatening if you cause some kind of uh, impact like that. So you would typically separate those out. What we're doing here is essentially the same thing, but all of these nodes are in the same cluster. So there's no ETL. You can just leverage built in MongoDB replication and you have um, all of the data you need. So that's kind of how you would do it if we were doing it in production, but we're obviously not gonna do that today. So we're just gonna go with our M0 cluster without any analytical nodes. And we're going to start working with the uh, rocket data. So let's kind of do that. So what I'm gonna do is bring up Compass 
And I am already connected to my Atlas cluster. If you, um, the pre-work walks you through how to do that. So it should be straightforward. And you can see here, this is an empty database. So my, I haven't done anything besides just set it up like I did in the pre-work. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create a MongoDB database in which to load our data. So I'm going to click on Create Database, and we're going to call it um, Launch Data. And the collection name is going to be Rocket Data. And you know, if, the, if this was a production application, we would say, hey, this is time series data. So time series data is any data that arrives at regular intervals, you know, typically produced by um, different types of machines and sensors. Obviously, a rocket is an example of that, but it could be your home thermostat or could typically be weather for, data. For an IoT scenario, be, right? Yeah, IoT yeah. scenario. It could be like car telemetry data. I work with a, a large car manufacturer that puts uh, a device that captures telemetry data as you're driving along the road, things like that. And so you would check this. If, probably use these in a production scenario and fill out this form. Um, as I was setting up for the live stream, this adds a little bit more complexity and I think it takes too long, but almost everything we do today would work with live stream, uh, with time series collections. So we're not gonna use them, but you probably would in a production scenario. So we've got our launch data database with our rocket data collection, and we're gonna go ahead and create that, um, that database. And you can see here now, we now have a launch data database here on the left-hand side. And if I open that up, we've got a rocket data collection in there, like we described. And I'm going to add one other collection called notes. And these, that's going to be where we're going to store the notes that are generated by the technicians during the launch. So that's pretty straightforward. The next thing we're going to do is load the data. So I'm going to just click on the rocket data collection and then add data and then import from file. And then you can just click select file. And um, I have this all set up, so it just works. But this is, if you look at the path here, it's within my GitHub folder, the rocket live stream archive and a repository, and then the data folder, right? Just probably should show that. Um, the, the, the setup, the architecture of the GitHub repository is really three folders, the data, which I'm just about to load, and then I've got folders for each of the live stream. And if you click in like live stream one, it has the slides I just showed through, showed, and then some of the queries that we're going to build, which we haven't gotten to yet, but those are um, in here as well. So if I go back to Compass, um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna select the rocket data file and do open and just say import. And this will take, it's about 120,000 records. So it'll take about 60 seconds. Um, so, you know, we can, uh, yes, I'll just, so once this is done, we'll load the notes collection and then we'll look at the data and then we'll start writing some queries. So we're almost there. We're nothing better on live stream than watch a progress bar. <laughs> Watch something, watch the water boil. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Ken, cool. so while, while we're waiting, there's a question. Yeah. Let's show it. Great question from Elil Godson. Can charts now be deployed on mobile apps? So, charts. So, you'll see on the next live stream, I'm going to embed charts into a React application. Mm -hmm. So while there isn't a like a charts SDK that works with um, Kotlin or something like that, but if you built a you know, React Native app, where you know it's, it should be able to, you should be able to embed a chart into a mobile app. Yeah. So what you what you end up getting is a an embeddable uh, set of JavaScript. So right. if you're using a framework like, uh, well, even like Flutter, I mean, you could you could. Yep. Yeah. That would be another way to do it. Correct. Okay. All right, so we, I just loaded the rocket data. I'm going to load the notes and then we'll take a look at it. So just go to the note, just click on the notes collection, click add data, import from a file, and then select the file. In this case, we're going to select notes. This one only has like 200 records, so it's pretty much instantaneous. All right, so now we have the data. So once you're at this point, you should have the launch data database with the two collections with the data loaded. And then if we look at the rocket data um, 
collection, it's got a bunch of documents in it. So one thing about this use case is it's not like we get a single, we get a thousand um, readings as individual JSON documents. The way this use case works is that you've got a bunch of sensors on the rocket and they produce a payload of data, each one of those sensors. So in this case, if I click open this meta um, sub document here, you can see that the, the device is called truth. And these are all the readings uh, that were produced by that particular device at this particular moment in time. So this rocket launch happened in October of 2020 over like a 15 minute period. That's how much we have like 15 minutes worth of data here. So you'll see all of them are all the readings are within that time boundary. And just to give you an idea, if I, you know, how MongoDB queries work, just in case you haven't, you know, um, used MongoDB before, it's just query by example. So if I just say metadata, um, the meta.device is truth, like we're looking at. So now I'm saying I only want documents where meta.device has the can value you, of can truth. You, can you bump that up a little bit? Hit, Make it I bigger? Mean, like, to, you mean yeah, like a little this? Bit. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Command plus. There we go. There we go. Is that, is that nice. Good? That's better. Yeah. Okay. So <clears> if you <throat> see right now, there's 12,000 docu documents in here, 120,000 documents in here. If I do this find, that is going to reduce our result set to about 79,000 documents. But there are other types of devices, uh, as you would expect. So if one of them is called DLC. And if I do a find there, you'll see that we're now getting all of DLC devices, right? So they're all DLC. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing here is they have different parameters. They have different metrics associated with them. And we have all of this in the same collection, right? So if you compare this to what you would have to do in a relational database, for example, you'd have to build a table for each one of these different devices. And that That's would work. But now in your application, you'd have to you know, issue some kind of union query or something like that whenever you wanted to grab all this data. And then if you supporting a new rocket that has other types of devices, you would have to update your data model again and update your application. Where yep. the real power of MongoDB, and we really talk about this all the time, is developer productivity. This is going to work with any rocket, really, because we essentially we're going to be able to consume any data that rocket um, consume, uh, generates without having to make any changes to our database. Uh, I want to issue a little question here for the, yep. for the viewers, and we've got a MongoDB T-shirt up for grabs for the for the randomly picked right answer. What is the term that we use to describe the capability of supporting multiple shapes in the same collection of documents? So many documents, different shapes in the same collection. What what's the term that we use? Don't don't say the word. Uh, so put your answer in the comments. I'm going to pick one from random and uh, we'll contact you either on YouTube or on LinkedIn, depending on where you're viewing. It's not schemaless, although that might be close. Um, so the question is, what's the term we use to describe the capability that MongoDB has to support different shapes of documents? And that's a keyword. It's a little hint there. Different shapes, many shapes. So go ahead, Jay. Excellent. All right. So now just to show the notes collection here, um, if you look at this notes collection, each note has a title. It had this notes field is the actual body of the notes. We're also talking about there's also a type here, which is just characterizing or classifying the type of note. in this case, the most common one is a parameter or a reading is out of bounds. So in this case, an out of bounds notification is setting for a LIDAR device, this particular parameter exceeded a particular threshold, right? So that's kind of the, and then who wrote the note? Some of these you'll see are generated, if you look through the data set on your own, some of these are generated manually. You know, I generated them because this is kind of fake data, or some of them are generated um, by a trigger, which we'll talk about next week, where I have written a trigger that looks at each of these documents as they are loaded. And if one of them contains a parameter that's out of the expected bounds, it generates a note of this format. And just to show you a little bit more advanced queries in the MongoDB query language, we could say, hey, we care about all parameters, you know, where the value is, oops, where the value is, um,
Right, so that, that's very similar to what we were before, but I can add more constraints to this. So I can say where the value of, the, of that particular value is greater than 28. So one thing about when you're building MongoDB queries in this type, like a find query that we call these, um, when we're just looking for a set of documents, it's really query by example. You just specify, you know, for each, each of the fields that you care about, what value or what value, specific value you're looking for, or what range of values is acceptable. And if I do find here, um, you'll see that none of these uh, actually return. So I think this is supposed to be an uppercase S and then maybe, there we go. So there are two documents that, that are in the data set for, that have a parameter of OMPS Doppler speed NPS4 and the value is greater than 28. You can see this one is 28.9 and this one, yeah, so both very similar. So, that, so that's how you interact with MongoDB in terms of just finding data, but we wanna do analytics. So if you look here, we've been working under the documents tab, where in MongoDB, we, there's a component of MongoDB called the aggregation framework. If you wanna learn more about it, Google MongoDB aggregation framework. But the way you interact with the aggregation framework is to use this aggregations tab. So I'm gonna click on the rocket data collection and then select aggregations. And what you'll see here when I get to this tab is we have the, we have the same documents that were in rocket data, but now they're just presented horizontally across the screen. And you'll understand why we're doing that in a second as we, when we start to build this query. And what I'm gonna do here is just build a group query. So we, well, all I wanna do is understand what are the different types of devices in my data set and how many readings I've gotten from each one, right? So that's kind of a, you know, this, the group operator is typically the basis of many types of aggregations where you group by a certain set of the data and then count average, you know, sort, whatever it is, calculate the standard deviation for the members of the different groups. So let's, we're gonna do a simple group here. So I'm gonna click on add stage and then I'm gonna select uh, group. So there are a whole host of different operators supported by MongoDB. And this, oper this set of operators is, makes it possible to build any query that you can build in SQL. Now the, the language is different, but in terms of, if you know, if you want to do a, a left outer join or something like that, you can definitely do that in this uh, query language. So we're going to grab group. And um, when I click on group, it gives me a template to fill out. So the field that we want to group by goes, goes right here. So in this case, we're going to group by meta.device. And I need to put, and then anytime in the aggregation framework, if you want to, if you want to reference the value of a document, you just proceed that particular um, field name to, with a dollar sign. And that says grab the values from the documents. And then we're gonna just put count here. And the accumulator we're gonna use is appropriately named dollar count. And then we don't need to pass any arguments to it. So we're just gonna do an empty, um, is there and then what you'll see here now is like we saw when I did the find query there are one of the devices is called lidar and there are 792 documents in the um, database that contain uh, that are for lidar devices there's 600 there's 66,000 for the truth devices and there are 32,000 documents that contain uh, readings for the, from the DLC devices. So this is a really simple aggregation query. Let's kind of like, you know, uh, turn it up a notch as Emerald used to say. So what we're gonna do now mm -hmm. is we're gonna, typically you don't group all of the data. Typically what you're gonna do is you're gonna group a subset of the data you care about. Maybe you care about, you know, oxygen flow rates in one of the, you know, engine stages or something like that, right? So you can, what you wanna typically do is proceed a group with a filter so that you select the subset of the data you want to group. So I'm just going to collapse this group stage for a second because we're going to use it. And I'm going to add another stage. And in this case, the filter stage is called um, dollar match. So we're going to select that dollar match. But I want my match to come before my group, right? Because I want to mm -hmm. filter always. and then group. Question? All, no, I'm just saying always. You, you, as many times as possible, you always want that, that match stage to come first. Yes, because right, groups are really expensive operations. 
-hmm. So the more you can filter out the data set to only be the data you care about, the faster this query is going to run. Yeah. All right. So I just want to take a, a pause before you add that match. So the correct answer is polymorphism, many shapes, many shapes. So MongoDB supports different shapes of documents in the same collection. So Q-tip, you are the winner. So uh, we'll have to get in touch with you. I'll, uh, I'll hit you up on YouTube. Thanks, everybody. And I was going to say flexible document model. So I know a lot of people said flexible schema. These yeah, are great I... answers, by the way. <laughs> I was looking for polymorphism, many shapes. Excellent. <laughs> So in order to keep things manageable, what we're going to do is we're going to look, we're going to restrict the set of documents we're going to process by time. So the query we're going to put in here is time. And we're going to, like you, like you saw me do before, I'm going to only care about meetings that occurred after a particular time period. So it's going to be, um, sorry, ISO date. And then I am just going to copy this time from the document in the GitHub repository, which I'm doing off screen and paste it in here. If you want that particular date, you can just go find the aggregation queries in the GitHub repository. So now that gives us the, um, the query. Now you can see that Compass isn't happy. It's giving us this little X arrow here, which most likely means I forgot a curly brace. So when I do that, it'll run the query here. And what Compass will do is put the results of this stage to the right of the my actual code here. So now these are where the top row contains all the documents in the collection. The second row contains only those documents that have a timestamp that occurs after um, like 1.46 p.m. on the 13th of October, 2020. And you'll see that this, this document um, comes just after it and so on and so forth. And then, so we still have our group. So if we open up our group now, you'll see that we have the same results. The numbers are just smaller because we're working on the uh, small, you know, on a smaller data set because we have that match applied. And then I'm going to do one other thing, just to kind of, you know, often, you know, if if developers have looked at MongoDB in the past, you know, they're not aware that MongoDB can do, you know, MongoDB is an asset compliant database, which it is. It also can do joins. So I'm just gonna show you that as well, just to kind of prove that point. So I'm gonna click and add another stage. The join operator in MongoDB is called dollar lookup. So we're going to do a lookup and we're going to join the documents from this in this query to the notes, right? That's the only other collection we have in this particular example. So we're gonna to join to the notes collection. And the field we're going to join from, if we look at this, we're going to join this underscore ID field. So we're just going to do an equijoin for today. If you look in the comment here, there are other fields to the join, like let and pipeline that allow you to do more um, sophisticated joins. But we're just going to do an equijoin today. So we're just going to put in, um, you know, the underscore ID for the for the local field, and then we need to join that with some field foreign field, you know, some field on the notes collection. So I'm gonna open another tab in Compass here, and then we're gonna to go to notes, and we're gonna join that um, field with the device field here. So what we're going to do is embed inside of each group, all of the notes associated with the devices corresponding to that group. So if I go back to my original tab here, we're just going to say that the foreign field is, is called, um, device. And then we're going to say, we're going to put those in a notes field. So when we run that query now, what you'll see is for my truth device, it now has a notes array. And if I open that up, you'll see that there are 80 notes, oops, sorry, uh, 80 notes associated with that, 80 notes that are associated with the truth device. And I can click up, click, open up one of those. And you'll see that the device is truth and if I open up another one, it again is gonna be associated with truth. And similarly for the DLC, if I do the same thing, you know, there's 43 notes there. And if I open that this one, you'll see that the they're all associated with the device DLC. So in this, I just completed a join between the notes and the uh the um my the the, pro, the the groups that were created by my aggregation query on the rocket data. And if mm. you look here at the top here you'll see that the 
compass is giving us a pictorial view of the stages here. We first did a match, then we did a group, mm -hmm. and then we did a dollar lookup. Okay, super, and super would, powerful. Super yeah, powerful super uh, explanation here of, of aggregation framework, building a pipeline. Um, the output of, the, of each individual stage is passed to the next in stage. And what we're doing here is really powerful because we're demonstrating one way to, to express relationships between data. One way to do that in MongoDB is to embed them in a single document. But what we're showing here is you can have multiple collections and join them just like, just as you would have to do in relational technologies, right? Absolutely. Um, there's a question for Block Programmer. He's saying, how is the performance of MongoDB lookup in comparison to relational databases? So, you know, well, one thing is you would definitely, I mean, so it's definitely not going to be equivalent. I mean, relational databases, because you're using a, a normalized model, everything depends upon a join. So if I'm a, a developer of a relational database, I've got to put in, you know, massive years of engineering to make joins as fast as possible. In MongoDB, you're supposed to use a denormalized document model. That is where the performance benefits come. That is also where the developer productivity comes. But at the same time, we also give you the ability to use joins when you need them. So if you apply, if you use them judiciously in your application, performance will be great. If you like try and take your, you know, relational schema and just copy the data, you know, table for collection and try and you know, do joins all over the place, you probably won't be that happy. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So a couple other things I just want to mention here, and then we're going to switch to charts before we run out of time. First, you need to save this query. So I'm not going to do this, but just you click on save and give it a name so that you can uh, grab it later. The other is, is I'm sure people on the call are saying, this is great, Jay, but I like, I write my code in Java or Node or Kotlin or Python or whatever. How do I actually run this particular query in my code? So the one cool thing about Compass is it gives you this button here called export to language. So if I click on that export to language, what you can do is it will show you essentially what the query looks like if you were going to run it in the MongoDB command line tool. And then you can pick the language that you want. And then, you know, some languages require, you know, lots of supporting libraries and classes and things like that. So if I'm a Java programmer, I can just go ahead and click on this and click on this. And it's going to give me the complete code on how to run this query in my application. Love that. Yeah, so it's real time saver. So, I mean, when I do development, I build all my complex aggregation queries in Compass, then go to this button, you know, go to this little GUI here, get the code in the language I'm developing in and, you know, paste it right into my application. All right, so that's Compass. And that's how you would build analytical queries that you're going to embed in your application. What if you want to have visualizations um, in your application, you want to have a pie chart or a bar chart or a line graph or whatever. How would we do those? So, you know, there's lots of ways you could build them. You could write the aggregation query that we looked at and then grab some graphing package, you know, and whatever, you know, from Node or whatever and JavaScript and then integrate the two. But the really cool thing is that MongoDB Atlas provides a tool called Charts that enables you to build these visualizations in a graphical tool point and click, which I'm going to show you. And then it has an SDK where you can take that visualization that you created and embed it right into your application. So like I said earlier, we're going to build the chart today. And next week, we're going to actually embed that chart using the SDK into a uh, simple React app. Great. So I'm going to switch over to um, my Atlas interface again. And if you look at the Atlas uh, UI, we've been looking at the data services tab which is where you work with the, the clusters and the data. We're gonna to switch to this other tab called charts. So if we switch to charts, um, you know, if you're like me and this is a brand new account, you won't have anything in there. So what first thing we need to do is create a dashboard. So you can just click on add dashboard and I'm just gonna call it live stream one. Oops. But you feel free to call it whatever you want. And then we're going to do is we're going to add one or more charts. So we're going to add a chart today. Um, so we're going to click on add chart. And the first thing it's going to ask us is where should I, you know, where's the data for this particular chart? 
right? So in this scenario, we only have one cluster, so there's one choice, but you can envision, you know, if this is a, an account you're using at work, you might have 28 clusters listed here. And then you can open up this particular tab here and um, you know, list the database that we that was that's in that cluster. And if there's more than one database, obviously they would be listed there. And we're gonna select the rocket data. So rocket data is going to be the foundation for this particular chart. And what you get on the left-hand side is all of the fields that we've been looking at um, in the data. So it just mushes, you know, smushes together all the fields from the DLC and the truth and the LiDAR devices. So we have all the possible fields. And then we're go you can see in this, in charts, you have a wide variety of different types of visualizations you can build. So, we're, you know, again, today we don't have time to explore all of them. I'm going to just build a, a line chart, but the documentation is really great. There's also other um, blog posts and live streams on charts. So feel free to you know, do a little searching and you can find those. But we're going to create a chart today where the x-axis is time. And the y-axis is going to be the velocity readings from the truth device. So we're going to just drop all three of those velocity readings into the y-axis of our. And Wait as I'm doing this, you'll see it can't the, be that easy. <laughs> it, I know it's crazy. It can't be, but it is. And then what I'll show next week is it's really like two lines of code to go to basically use the SDK, you know, to create a, to create a React component that essentially just embeds this chart. And, um, so it's, it's really powerful. It saves you a huge amount of time if you need to do something like this in your application. So this is what you get by default. And then I'm sure you've used tools similar to this where you got to go in now and, and clean it up a little bit. So, you know, so this could be uh, truth veloc uh, velocity, right? So we can give it a name. And then these field names might make sense to whoever is generating the data, but they probably don't make that much sense to, you know, the, you, whoever is reading this chart. So we can go in and customize. You can essentially customize everything. In this case, we'll customize the fields and I'll say, I want to do, you know, I want to clean up this particular first velocity reading. So I'll click on label override and, you know, we can just change that to velocity and, or something like that, right? So you can see how you can just go in here and you know clean this up so that it you know it it looks really good and then embed it into your application. So this is charts, and then once we're done, we just go ahead and save it. And um, you can share these charts just as a dashboard. So if you wanted to send somebody a link and they could look at it this way. And like I said, next week we're going to actually build a React app where you can embed this chart this chart into your application using the charts SDK. So to just wrap up, um, you know, what we did today is we loaded some rocket data and notes, and then we looked at how we can use MongoDB Compass to build, you know, aggregation queries in our code, as well as how we, and then how we can do, oh, we also looked at how we can use charts to build graphical visualizations for our real-time analytics. And then, like I said, next week, we are going to embed that chart into a React app and then talk about some of the other advanced capabilities that we offer, like search and triggers that make it easy to set up and uh, build apps like this. And then finally, the, in two weeks, we'll take a look at, all right, the launch is over. How do we compare the data from this launch to the previous launch, or how do we integrate some weather data in S3 into our um, visualizations and analytics. And we'll continue to use the Mongo query language, but we will also use SQL for this as well. Outstanding. So SQL right from the same interface. Well, yeah, I mean, using a, we're gonna, I'm gonna use DBeaver, which is just an open source, um, you know, SQL client, but you mm -hmm. can, you know, if you want to use Tableau or Power BI or whatever, it, you can do that as well. Outstanding. All right. So I want to remind folks, there's uh, resources and links at mdb.link slash rocket. I'm going to leave that up for a second. And then we're going to give you the GitHub as well. If you didn't get to follow along today, uh, hit this GitHub, clone that repository. The data is there. You can do exactly what Jay just did. You can find this video on YouTube and LinkedIn 
and go back through it, get prepared. We're going to be back on March 22nd to uh, to continue our journey and develop an app. Um, Blocked Programmer had another great question, and I'll put that up. Yeah, sure. MongoDB is a great choice for time series data. Jay, tell them why. So it is, and we've spent significant amount of engineering making it that way. So in MongoDB, um, modern versions of MongoDB, like 5.0 and beyond, we added a special type of collection called time series collections. And then we've also added um, clustered indexes as well. So those two things make working with MongoDB time series data really powerful. So the first thing is when you load time series data into a time series collection, under the covers, you don't ever see it, but under the covers, we change how we store the data to really compact it down. And we also store the data essentially organized by time because most of the time when you're doing uh, you know, time series, work with time series data, you know, time ranges are a big part of your query. So having the data stored continuously on disk by time makes it really performant in terms of doing queries. So you get kind of two benefits. One is you get an optimal storage format. So it reduces, you know, the size of your data by, you know, 5, 10x, let's say. And then you also get dramatically high performant queries because of the fact that we've kind of stored data in a way to support the types of queries you typically run over time series. And then I think another thing I didn't mention is that around 5.0, we significantly enhanced the MongoDB aggregation framework query language so that it has a whole set of time series relevant operators, things like window functions. You know, Often when you're using time series data, you don't care about the whole data set from the beginning of time. What you really want to understand is what's happened in the last minute or the last hour. So you want to do lots of rolling window calculations. So there are operators within the aggregation framework for doing that. Outstanding. Uh, Mary's asking about the GitHub link. It's just off of github.com slash jrunkle slash rocket capital L live stream. Hope that helps, Mary. Hope you can find it there. So have some folks asking you about T-shirts. We'll, we'll be giving away more T-shirts during the next live stream. If you want to win a, a fancy MongoDB podcast T-shirt, uh, you can join us next week. Stay tuned for the trivia questions. While you're at it, subscribe, like. Uh, you can find MongoDB podcast on all podcast networks, and you can find it at mongodb.com slash podcast. You can hear great discussions about this very same topic, as well as other discussions with software developers, data scientists, anything that um, folks in the software and data industry would be interested in. We try to cover that stuff. Jay, this has been a great discussion. Thanks for the demo. I'm looking forward to next week. Anything else we want to add before we, we break for the day? No, I think that's it. I really appreciate everybody who's joined us today. Yeah, and thanks for the questions. Hey, bring your questions next week. We're going we're gonna to have Jay live once again on March 22nd, same time. And uh, we'll be on LinkedIn Live as well as YouTube. Check out the podcast episode uh, with Jay and myself discussing this very same issue on mongodb.com slash podcast. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. See you next week, Jay. See you next week.